I'm Jaden Jefferson here joining you from the 577 Foundation in Perrysburg, and I'm joined by Kathleen Biggins, who is the founder and president of Sea Change Conversations. And here's the thing, you're not a scientist, but one of the things you're passionate about, though, is the climate. And so talk about the work of Sea Change Conversations. So we are a nonpartisan, not-for-profit that started 10 years ago to find a way to talk about the climate issue um, in a way that would not inflame partisan fervor, and in a way that was science-based and that was apolitical, um, because we felt in some ways that climate change had a communications problem, that people weren't able to really hear what was coming and to prepare for it. Um, because there was just too much emotion and too much disinformation out there. And so we wanted to clarify it and, and help people become safer themselves. And a key part of getting that information is, of course, hearing from people in the field, hearing from scientists. And so what has been their contribution to your efforts? Mm. So we have a presentation that we bring around the country. We've talked to about 20,000 people in 32 states. And our presentation is based on science. So we have advisors at uh, NOAA. We have advisors at Climate Central. We use materials from NASA, um, groups that people normally look to with respect or to help keep them safe. And just kind of talk about the impact of having a conversation that isn't political, because everything these days apparently is political. But when we're talking about our planet, it's not. It's something we're all going to experience. And so why is it important to just have that conversation without making it such a political conversation? Because um, on this topic, because it has been so politicized, people are kind of reticent to talk about it. When we first started 10 years ago, it was kind of a taboo topic. Um, you didn't want to talk about it in a crowd of friends. You didn't want to talk about it at a dinner table because it just was uncomfortable. And yet, if people don't understand how many others are concerned, in fact, 70% of Americans are concerned, then they feel kind of isolated and alone. And then we don't get that momentum towards acceptance and, and policy and movement that we really need. And I can see how it can be hard for some people to acknowledge what's happening because if you're just going about your daily life, unless you're me, it's probably not one of the top things on your mind, but it's a big issue. And so for people that are just stuck in that everyday hamster wheel going through things, not thinking about it, what role can they play and what things can they do in order to be the solution to the problem? Yeah, and, and I think that more and more as we go through our normal days, we are seeing it. We're seeing it in these crazy rainstorms. We're seeing it in the extremely hot summer days. We're seeing it when our spring flowers come out way too early and maybe get hammered by a, a, a freeze. Um, so we are seeing it around us, and we're seeing it on our TV sets. We're seeing it in disasters all around the world. So I think it is infiltrating a bit already um, if we are open enough to see it. I also think that individual action is critical, but it's most critical when it influences others. Just doing something on your own by yourself is much less powerful than doing it in a group. So things you can do is join um, your town green committee and work on creating an urban canopy to help cool down the city. Um, things you can work on is looking to decarbonize your school, looking at food waste, looking at whether they are using clean sources of energy, looking at what other ways they are recycling instead of buying things afresh. Um, and also for households, I mean, a big part is taking a look at the energy you're using as an individual, whether it's what you drive, whether it is how you heat your home, um, and what you eat. And one of the really cool things is seeing how cities have been able to innovate, because you look at an urban environment and you think, this is kind of a big important area when it comes to climate change. And in the city of Toledo, there's now a lot of money being put towards just planting trees. And so what kind of impacts do those types of things have when cities say, we're gonna put thousands of dollars into replanting some areas and putting trees in areas they weren't before? It's critically important. Your summers are getting a lot hotter. They are already 3.8 degrees hotter than they were back in 1970. And you have 24 days that are at the hottest of the summer days than you did back then. And in urban areas, because there is so much steel and concrete, they don't cool down. They don't have the plants in the green space for the evaporation that cools down the air. And so planting trees is critical for cities. And because in most areas, um, people are moving into cities, and they're gonna be even more crowded in the future. Um, figuring out ways to decarbonize and cool down our cities is critically important.
And one of the other things, too, is that we're getting a lot of cities that are having these kind of federal investments where the federal government is even acknowledging that this is a problem. And so from what you've seen so far, do you think enough is being done or can we go further? Ah, uh, that's, that's a really loaded question. I think that more is being done than has been in a very long time. Um, unfortunately, we're a little late to the party because there was a lot of kind of pushback on, on buying into the science or, or understanding the consequences or being worried that other countries would outcompete us by using cheaper fuel sources and we'd be stuck using the more expensive ones. But that's all been turned on its head. Today, fossil fuels are the more expensive choices and renewables are actually cheaper. So um, looking at what is coming online in our own country right now, 86% of all new power that came online in 2023 was fossil free. And that's because of the economics. Yes, the federal government policy is critically important. Um, it is really moving the needle. There are things that are happening, jobs that are being created all over, including right here in Ohio. Um, but it's not enough by itself. We all need to do more. And one of the best things is that we're in an area that's pretty cool to highlight climate because the thing is, this is a microclimate. It feels a bit tropical. Just talk about places like the 577 Foundation that can really just give people perspective because we have koi fish swimming over here. We have plants growing all around us. And so for people to have the ability to actually see plants and see wildlife and see what people are fighting for, what impact does that have internally when you have to look at the wildlife? Hmm. Well, I think any time being out in nature is critically important just to our mental health and our physical health. I think also being reminded of how connected we are, how dependent we are, pen dependent we are on nature is critical. Um, we can't live without our natural systems working the way they have the entire time our species has been on this planet. And we're upsetting those natural systems. And it reminds us that we're part of the bigger picture. So yes, critically important. And one of the things is you're in the area also talking with students, of course, because students, they're the next generation. and They're definitely, they have a lot more to fight for. And so in talking with them, what do you get out of that experience? Oh, well, I, I am always so impressed with their curiosity and their energy and their concern. Um, and sometimes even their specific knowledge about this topic. I have been stopped after a presentation and drilled on exactly what kind of type of nuclear is coming and what kind of nuclear is better. And, and this young student knew them all. And I was like, whoa, you're above <laughs> my pay grade right there and then. Um, but I do think it's critically important to educate the youth because if you don't understand the issue well, all it does is scare you. And in fact, we have so many opportunities to make it better. We have so many solutions that if we embrace and act quickly with, we can really change the future and in some ways change it better than it even has been in the recent past. So to me, we are kind of at a knife's edge. We can either slow down and really get ourselves in more trouble or we can act and if we do, um, there'll be incredible opportunities for this young generation to be the leaders and the change makers. And I've never thought the message should have been for the younger generation because they already heard it. They already know. And I think the message should have always been for the older generations that may not have gotten it or may not have understood just the significance and the impacts that we're going to experience and are experiencing. And so for the older generations who are watching right now who still aren't sold on the urgency of the situation, what would be your message to them? Well, it's interesting you point that out because actually age is one of the things that really does separate people who are less concerned and more concerned. Um, I, I think that when you see the science and understand what is projected if we act and what is projected if we don't, and we have those numbers. And we know that right here in Toledo, if we stay on our current emissions path for the youngest generation, that they will be facing temperatures as much as 10 degrees hotter at the end of the century. But if we act, it would only be limited to around four. That is a huge difference. And I think being able to quantify that and see that and understand that it's the emissions we put up today that will impact your future and our grandchildren's future tomorrow. So we have agency here, 
and we have responsibility. For sure. Just because the winter is in my favorite season doesn't mean I don't want winter at all. That's basically the message. Kathleen Biggins, president and founder of Sea Change Conversations, thanks for joining me. Uh, thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you. And joining you here from 577 Foundation in Perrysburg, I'm Jaden Jefferson.